<laughs> oh, hi, Rachel. Thank hi, you. Rachel. Thank you. She's so like, let's let's you. do this. Let's do this. Yes. I don't know how to do that. So I just share it after. And then my people are like, well, I didn't know what was happening. I'm like, no. <laughs> So. Yeah. Well, um, this is automatically streaming on all three of our Facebook pages at this moment. I have my Facebook page open. Uma has hers open. So as people ask questions, we can respond. Okay. And I'm also going to put the link to that short video on what is white fragility, just so people have questions, they can that really gives a, a wealth of information. Okay, well, um, you guys, <laughs> hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Bonita Woods and I'm here with Uma Alexandra Bipat and Dr. Daryl Harris Thorne. Dr. Daryl Thorne. <laughs> And we are going to address, uh, the last time we spoke, we addressed uh, the difference between racism and white privilege, which of course they're really different, but- um, Connected, they're still connected, right? Yeah, you know, racism creates white privilege. Having white privilege does not make you a racist. It's just sadly a reality in our world right now. Uh, so if you have more questions on that, um, I'll put a link to our, our events on that in the comments section. And today we are going to discuss what is white fragility and how can we evolve that so it becomes an interconnected state of human, you know, oneness. Um, we are here, the three of us, me, um, to be honest, partly because I've got the white privilege. You know, I get to speak out on things because I'm white. Although I'll tell you this last week, I've been slammed by a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of hate mail. Number of people stopped following me. I've been told that I'm a false prophet and I should shut my mouth. And a lot of people who say they feel like I'm singling them out and calling them racist. So for any of you who feel, I'm, I'm not calling anyone. If you are watching this video, I will not call you a racist. If you've watched any of my previous videos, it has never been my intention to call you a racist. But I always say when something in response, a trigger reaction bubbles up, that is your opportunity to really look in and say, what do I need to heal? What do I need to release? What do I need to evolve and grow? So you are really being triggered into a huge personal lesson. I'm always happy to be here for you. We all are. But um, if you feel like I'm calling you a racist, either I'm putting my foot in my mouth and I've issued a lot of apologies because I do that, I'm not perfect. And or probably a combination of the two, this is an opportunity for you to really grow into yourself. Uma is with us because she is an outspoken human rights advocate um, and she has been experiencing a lot of response today from people who really have, from observation, nothing wrong with their lives that they need to hate on anyone that much. And I asked Daryl with us because she's, you are Native American, African American and a wonderful mishmash of the world as well as um, professional, a uh, professor and politically active and a counselor. You know, you are like the one person who really can explain everything from a professional <laughs> and investigative and a personal, you know. Um, so don't want me to start this, Uma. I had, uh, you said you had an experience yesterday that- It, it you know. <laughs> I'm not gonna go too much into it because you guys can go on my page and see what happened. But basically um, there was a post by a man that felt he was attacked in a protest, a peaceful protest. Um, usually, as you guys know, I only comment on my, my feed, but I, I felt the need to comment on that one because he really had a very interesting way of recounting what happened to him despite the video footage. And then when I noticed that it was shared 1700 times, I said, this is how hate starts. It's just misinformation getting out there. So I challenged his viewpoint 
um, I was the only one on his thread of over 1500 comments to really at that time challenge him on his viewpoint. And then I had like maybe about six to eight um, white people come down on me for my views. This one woman in particular, Julie Fletch, um, was coming at me and telling me like nasty things, you know, just I'm an ass, go back to my country. If she saw me in the road, she would run me over. Um, so my, me and her engagement, it went on for a while, but then it, it became less about me answering and then more me be, like making it a social experiment because I wanted to see, I'm like, if I just remain neutral and calm and polite and respond to her digs at me, I'm like, what would happen? Would we come out of this at the end, you know, agreeing to meet in the middle ground or how would it turned out? Unfortunately for me, it didn't turn out well. Um, and this was a, a clear example of white fragility. It, she felt everything was a personal attack. She thought like she was so wound up in her hate that she read it as if I was a protester at that thing. And she was, you know, talking to me like, ah, you should have been there. And I'm like, I wasn't there, you know? Then she claimed at the end, it, it finally ended with it, um, her saying that I was terrorizing her and I was threatening her. And I said, this is, well, hello, Amy Cooper. This is how it starts, right. Right. you know? So that's just recent, but, you know, and I was posting it on my wall. I know some of you might have disagreed with that by, you know, calling her out by name and stuff. But to me, if you're doing anything on social media, you're doing anything on social media. And there's nothing that I put out on social media that I am ashamed of. Since, uh, you know, since she's realized that I have pretty much screenshot all her stuff and put it on my page, she's gone now and removed all her comments and then even started coming after me today again on another thread that had nothing to do with her and started coming back after me. And then, you know, saying uh, again that I was threatening her, even though she was coming after me. And I said, you know, wait, 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 does this sound like, hello, there's a dark skinned woman threatening me. Yeah, on somebody's thread. And I just told her that, um, listen, you can say what you want. I have screenshots of, of what you've said to me. And then she said, she started saying, where, where's your proof? Where? And I said, I have it. She's like, show it, show it. And then she started posting um, another woman that was coming after me. And she's like, that's not me, darling. You have me mixed up. And I'm like, wow, you really think, you know, like you're so smart. So oh I God. just blocked her. All of you look yeah. the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just blocked her because she just, she was trying to get an instigation out of me. And that's how that ended. And that's why I'm so happy it happened uh, in time for today's conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So and that was a clear evidence of her white privilege. Yeah. Right. As the overall, but then, and, and this is the thing with white fragility. So you have white privilege, whether or not people of whiteness feel that they have it or not, you have it. But then the fragility part comes in where there are these emotions that are around issues and matters of race. And Benita, you pointed out, you know, um, when people of whiteness feel that they are being called a racist or there's some type of emotionality that pops up when they're engaging in conver conversations about race or if they happen to be or stumble into a conversation about race or an event that has clear implications, that emotionality piece pops up and they become fragile, meaning the emotional state. And some of the emotions, you know, fear, anxiety, it could be shame. Um, there are, are, there's a myriad of emotions, but that's the fragility part. And then the actions kind of show where they are with it. And in the actions, they're also employing their white privilege to deny right? Mm -hmm. To justify, or in many cases, to manipulate the experience or the situation so that they then position themselves as victims. All of that is white fragility. Whether or not people of whiteness, and I purpose, I love this term that, you know, I feel like I created, I may not have, but I know that I started using it a while ago. And that is it, for me, uh, kind of an, an equity measure of this whole catch-all people of color, right? Mm -hmm. And so people of whiteness have a hard time dealing with anything that opens up and makes clear 
their whiteness and protections of it, regardless of what spectrum of mm -hmm. white you're on or what level or hierarchy, as I mentioned during our last conversation, within the white collective, there are certain levels of whiteness that are usually equated by social economic status, but most of us people of color aren't necessarily privy to the dynamics within that, right? So mm -hmm. when we experience people of whiteness, we experience collectively people of whiteness, right? But when you engage in conversations with varying people who represent the white racialized group, they may be quick to say, but you can't, all white people are not that way. And so that individualism piece pops into play as well as the social economic piece. You know, wealth doesn't equate what whiteness is. And folks forget right. that. Folks forget that. So just like there are different levels of how people um, perform their blackness or that their Latino-ness or their Caribbean-ness, you know? Right. Form their whiteness differently too. And folks forget that, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will admit recently, one of the most common, and Uma's experienced this as well. And this is where I'm about to give away some of my, like, you know, I'm a weirdo. Um, some of the most common rebuttals to me that I feel represent white frailty is people saying to me, you're speaking about caring for black people. And I'm like, and brown people and like, you know, like people right now who are asking for our help. And they're like, well, I wouldn't know because I don't see colors. I just see souls. And the only response I can say is, you know, as you know, I am a psychic intuitive. I see people's past lives. A very good one, people. Thank you. <laughs> when I when I am with a person, I see the past lives right there with them that are most connected with them. And um, the past lives that I see have color. They have a timeline. They have genders. They have attitudes. They have clothing. I see all of this. Two things I've noticed in my life of seeing like millions and millions of past lives because they're wherever I go and I'm no spring chicken. One, I have never seen anyone whose past lives are all the same gender and color they are, okay? It's about, you know, energetic connection, personality connection, what you're going through that, that two, I see their colors. I see all their colors. That is part of who they are. You know, if you look at someone and you deny their color, you're also denying an aspect that makes them an individual. You're denying getting to know them. And um, I was wondering if both of you could talk on this subject because, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't, we don't need I, just hear what the white gal says. Yeah, well, no, no, no. And I, and I think for people who actually know me, know that there are multiple levels of me and you're, you're part of my world. You know, I don't share all of my worlds with, with people, but the people closest to me understand the world that you're talking about. So that said, going back to the original um, comment and statement as tied to white fragility, the idea of colorblindness is actually a racist conception and idea, regardless of how it might have been framed in families, regardless of how you know it seems to to not be problematic and inclusive. The reality is is that it is, and Robin D'Angelo addresses this, um, who really coined the phrase and studied white fragility at length. Uh, Tim Wise, who really talks more about white privilege, mm -hmm. educating people, he talks about this. Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who is Latino, who has done a tremendous amount of work around this idea of colorblindness and that it is racist mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes largely into what you were saying. And, and some people can't even get to the metaphysical point that you were talking about, but, you know, Bonita. Um, but for those who can, I think they understand what you're saying. For the rest of the people that can't understand it, 
So talking about it in this physical moment in which they exist, what when they propose, I don't see color, I see people. One, you can say that, but it marginalizes almost everything else about that person's experience in their life walk. We all have had different experiences, you know, in this world. Mm-hmm. And you, people at large and society through census records, um, anything that, that, that makes you categorize yourself by race, when you check off black, or which this confusing thing, Hispanic, but not white or Hispanic, that whole thing, um, or white, you are also checking off that you can connect with a certain experience large in this country. And the experience of people who have been um, forced to be marginalized based on just solely the perception of the ideology of race tend to have more struggles or more challenging and different struggles than people who have been categorized by race by, as white. And again, for, for, for the, the folks who are trying to default to this social economic status, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking strictly about race and color of skin because race is a fabrication. However, the experiences that are connected with these ideas of race are real. And that is what we're seeing in the protest, you know, protesting now. And what people who claim that they are not racist, um, whether you are present as whatever white is, or whether you're dealing with forms of internalized racism, where you also are minimizing the experiences of people of color. You happen to be a person of color, (laughs) right? All of that happens. It's problematic because you're denying that this country was formed by oppressing bodies. Now, here's the one thing that, and I may be straying off topic, but it is absolutely all related. The one thing that does is problematic for me and I don't really give a damn if I get slack from anybody who looks like me, doesn't look like me, but I really don't care, but I'm gonna say it. What irritates me beyond belief is that folks wanna articulate and point to the original sin of this country as slavery. No, the original sin of this country was when people of whiteness came over, took the land by murdering, killing, terrorizing and then lying about it of all of the several indigenous groups of people who have very distinctive language and cultures here who are already on this land on on all of the americas that's the original sin yes and then followed by enslavement yep and other hijacked narratives around that right so we've never and, and when I say we, I'm talking about all of the Americas, North, South, Central, mm-hmm. not come to terms with the perpetuation of racism or white supremacy, rather, which is racism, on Black, Brown, and Indigenous bodies. Mm-hmm. We've come to terms with that. So now we're seeing all of this worldwide. We're seeing this massive amount of people coming together who represent diversity to its fullest extent. And then you still have this small section of people who are connected with whatever their whiteness is, who can't seem to come to terms with it and default to their white fragility mm-hmm. by denying it or bringing the depth of all of what's going on back to the superficiality, the flag. Who gives a goddamn about this flag? <laughs> Nothing is about the damn flag. It's not about the damn flag. The flag does not represent all of its people. And it's a cloth. It's, a, it's cloth. Human is much more meaning than a cloth. So well, this is true, yeah. So when people can even engage, specifically white people, when they can even entertain that level of superficial conversation, and then they get their feelings hurt because somebody challenges them, they're, they're deploying their white privilege, which is racism. It's a form of racism. And then they are sanction it through their white fragility 
And then they get upset when they're called out on those things. Yeah, and this is exactly what we've been experiencing. Um, and I do want to mention, and then Uma, I would love to hear your response on this, that I think that this situation, I mean, this is hardcore. We're going through a hard time in our country right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to get easier overnight. It's going to become more so. So we need to come to terms with our, you know, racisms, our fragilities, our privileges, our thoughts, our concepts, because the time is now. But I do think there are a number of people who have fallen into, this is just how things are without thinking about it. And now that they're thinking, they would like to change. They would like to evolve. So, um, and we are getting some questions in, which is great. Yeah. But Uma, I would like you to share your thoughts on white fragility. We'll take some questions from viewers. And then I want us to talk about solutions. So people don't feel you're just, we're just slamming you to know we are here to say, how can we evolve this from this mess we're in? But remember, giving birth is always messy, always. Yeah. So, so for me, the, the biggest problem of white fragility is that it divides us. Because when you were saying to me, oh, I'm too, you know, I'm too sensitive or emotional to go into this, or I don't want to own it, or I want to distract from it, or I don't want to face it. Mm -hmm. You're essentially saying your self of importance is more important than a sense of community. And I don't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. We are here together. And no one should be having a good night's rest knowing that the majority of the population suffers. Whether it's the hand of racism or inequality between men and women or you know, crimes against people with disabilities or LGBTQ, none of us should be getting a great night's sleep. If you call yourself a light worker, and I'm, I'm gearing this specifically to the spiritual community, this is an active role. It is not a passive role. We have a lot of people that come into the light working community. And I'm saying this as a spiritual teacher for the past 11 years, there is a lot of people, particularly white people, that come into the metaphysical world looking for an escape from their lives, from their problems. I don't work with those people anymore. Because once I start to identify in you, you're here really to just distract from your life. And you have no desire to actually change who you are or fix what's going on, then we don't need to be in communication anymore. There are many teachers that cater to that. They'll put up these fun classes and these meditations and, and things just to make people feel better. That to me is akin to the pharmaceutical industry. So I have a bigger fight here, right? And the fight has always been for me, for people to be true to who they are, to own it, to own who they are, and then to heal from it. You know, I very much follow Bob Marley. And in one of his songs, he said, none but ourselves can free us from our own minds. And that's the truth of it. I'm not here to pick on you. I've gotten a lot of white people tell myself, tell Benita that they feel Uma's picking on them. No, I am not here to pick on you. I am still in my spiritual teacher role. And if I'm identifying with you something and I'm saying, hey, let's look at this. It's the same thing I'm doing when you come to my classes and you talk about an issue and I say, hey, let's look at this. If you are taking it personally, you want to get to the bottom of what is triggering you about this. And I've had some really beautiful white people come to me and say, your words are triggering me, but I want to know why. Mm -hmm. And I want to work on this and I want to fix this. And I say, good, then we can work together. But then if you go to my words are triggering me, but I'm going to take it out on you. I just saw a white woman go off on Bonita's thread calling her a false shepherd and all of this. And that is unacceptable. If you yeah. call yourself a spiritual teacher, because she is apparently a spiritual teacher in the area. If you call yourself a spiritual teacher, then if you are having an issue with what Benita is saying, because again, I believe we have freedom of speech. 
and she's saying it on her platform, and that's the way she's choosing to use her energy and her voice, then you take it up with Bonita privately or you move on. You leave her group, you leave her page, and you move on quietly. I had the same issue happen, as you guys know, last week with another white woman and a spiritual teacher in the area who chose to come to my platform and publicly debase me. This is not love and light behavior. We each are allowed to have our own platforms and we each are allowed to follow them. I get people who come to me from other teachers and who say, this person is doing X, Y, Z. I said, God bless to her. That is her platform. She has every right to do it. So what we're seeing on Benita's wall, on my wall, is very a variety of experiences that point to white fragility. And it needs to stop. Because the truth is, is we need the white people's voice in this. We cannot do it alone. We need to stand together. And, you know, people have been accusing me of now being political. No, I'm sorry. This is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. And that's my say on it. <laughs> that's an excellent say. And, you know, I will say this. Um, I mean, the one, one thing that is coming up again and again here is this is a time for all of us to come together. And I am not saying just because I'm white, I have it better than anyone who's not white. Just as I'm not saying because I'm a woman, I have it worse than guys. I've had my experiences and I've made my choices in my life. And, you know, sadly for my family, happily, I don't know, I'm a mixed bag here. When I see someone who's being unfairly repressed, I speak up. If I see someone hitting a child, I speak up. I intervene. It, it's just who I am. If I see people whose only, you know, difference is the color of their skin being murdered in front of me, yeah, I'm going to speak up. That does not mean I think people who don't speak up are bad because there's a variety of reasons why people don't speak up. Some people, you know, and I'm not going to get into all of that because we all make our life choices. But if what I just said, I speak up, makes you feel bad for not speaking up, then you have a choice. You can be angry at me or you can look in yourself and see what you know, what answers you come up with, what answers are in there that are calling to you in the shape of a deep emotion. And that again will be individual. Um, so we have a question that I think is timely from Rachel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you define and tackle white fragility? What I've been doing is attempting to open up a conversation by starting with are you open to hearing and listening differing opinions? I've always met with the answer yes, but the conversation tends to prove otherwise. I think Dr. Daryl, we can hand this one to you. Yep. <laughs> well, and, and, I, and thank you, Rachel, because that's a great question. And that goes to how I was trying to characterize it. I will kind of plug a little more of, I know I keep Barbara D'Angelo is like the go-to right now. Um, and for everybody, before I forget, I know Bonita uh, posted a shorter version to give people kind of a quick tutoring um, session on white fragility. But I, if you don't have the book, the next best thing is to watch her. I think it's like an hour and 22 minutes. It's through um, video. I want to say it was done about four years ago or so, three years ago through the Seattle Public Library. So you can find it on YouTube. So, so she breaks it down flawlessly. But here's the thing, and this is why I gave a quick characterization of it. You saw and you experienced exactly what you were supposed to see and experience. Now, understand all of this is complicated. It's simple yet complicated mm -hmm. because it is what it is. You opened the door based on what you said. What you were met with was the person's superficial, and I'm, I'm gonna make, let me, let me frame this and I'm making a couple of assumptions. I'm assuming that you connect and you are ascri ascribed whiteness. So was the person that you opened the door to. So there was probably an assumption that the other person had that you and that person, by virtue of shared 
ideology of phenotype that you were on at the same place. And you were like, no, I'm going a little bit deeper. And that person couldn't handle it. So you didn't meet that person where they were and you challenged them to go deeper. And so, yes, you experienced the fragility. So you already know what it is. It's when you are meeting with somebody and who is white and they can't handle the emotion that you are stirring up within them about potentially what the conversation of whiteness meaning because you know to be called white you, it's a race people <laughs> race that you are raced just like people who are identified as black you are raced and people can't deal with that so there's an emotional piece it really depends on how you want to sit with them if you want to go through exploring it together with them i would suggest that your first thing is to really study Robin D'Angelo's work or to at least review that so that you have a better idea of what's going on. So the people kind of going back and connecting with what both Benita and Uma have said, in essence, when there is a more substantive and solid foundation with people, much like with buildings, going to have a stronger and better outcome. So there's a lot that happens beneath the surface. And when people are a little more connected with that in themselves, the fragility, what you see on top is not quite as fragile. So there's a lot more to, to that particular conversation, but it means that these people have done the work to say, you know what? I am triggered, much like what Uma was saying. I am triggered, and I'm not sure why I'm triggered, but I'm willing, instead of trying to save face, which is a, a, you know pretty big in the Asian community, but also in any community where it's, you make a mistake, a faux pas, and instead of owning it when everybody else can see it, you deny it, thinking you're saving face. Well, you're not, really. You, sometimes you look like an ass, sometimes you don't, but it's practice to say, oh, I think I just made a mistake. I'm willing to look at it. There are people who aren't ready to do that yet. Everybody, as Benito was saying, we all come into these lifetimes with certain lessons that we need to learn or certain journeys that we need to take. There are, I think, a fair amount of people who are stuck. There are so many more who are not stuck. They may not be solid in their walk, but they're willing to take the journey. And that is what I think I'm seeing, you know, today. Uh, and I probably strayed off from <laughs> Rachel's original question. I apologize. Um, but hopefully I've, I've, I've given her something to work with. Yeah. And Uma, when you feel your feel like a freight train, slamming into you that you're being uh, confronted with white fragility. Do you have any techniques that you have to help evolve the situation? Anything that's worked for you? I just, I stay calm. Mm -hmm. It really, it, if we're going to come out on the other side of this together, it depends on that person. So I've been on both sides of it. I've been on the sides where people are just angry. And for me personally, just in the conversations we're having, I see it more as anger at themselves that they're not wanting to own up because if you talk to every single white person, they can remember a time that something racist was said in their household. Mm -hmm. They will not deny it. Okay. They had that grandmother or that uncle or that friend of their father or friend of them, something along the line was said and it didn't sit well with them, but they were too young as children to say anything different. So then when you have somebody like me, a brown person coming out and saying white fragility, white fragility, white, you know, white, uh, not white power, white, um, what's the other one? <laughs> white power. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. you know, all this other stuff. <laughs> yeah, like white, <laughs> white, yeah. white privilege and stuff. It triggers that earlier memory in them. And instead of saying, gosh, you're right. You're right. I remember my grandmother said this and blah, 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 or my dad didn't allow me to date, you know, black men and stuff like that. Instead of going there, they go, 
the complete opposite, which is they were angry at themselves when they didn't say anything back then. Now they're angry at me for calling it out and it's just going to come right at me. So how I deal with it always is to stay polite, stay calm. Even when they're yelling at you, cursing at you, trying to cut you down, you stay calm. And then for some people that anger resides. And when that anger resides, then we're able to have that conversation. Well, what do I do? Where do I go from here? And my answer has always been use it for the cause. Mm -hmm. So what that you have white privilege, that's great. Enjoy the white privilege. That means you are never going to be stopped just because for the color of your skin, that means doors aren't going to be closed to you just because of the color of your skin. So now use it, use it for yourself, use it for the community, use it for people who can't use it. And that's what I would, I would extend that to yeah. that there's a great deal of responsibility. Right. That comes with it. Yeah. And that also comes with what Benita was talking about in terms of the evolution. How can we evolve it? Well, for people of whiteness who are beginning to really understand the impact and the power of their whiteness, just like there are people who have been, been identified as Black or ascribed Blackness who are finally seeing the power. And I'm, I got to give a shout out to all of the athletes, those especially those who stepped up um, to mm. Priest and all of his BS, um, mm -hmm. and also to the, the stepping up to confronting just all of the major leagues because they're finally, they have this power, but they're stepping into it and using it. And it's not lip service. Mm -hmm. So part of how we can evolve it is to do something. I want to go back a little bit to um, something Bonita said earlier about in terms of um, what people can do if they, uh, well, white people specifically, but any person, if they're not comfortable with what they're hearing from Bonita or from anybody else, or they're not at a place where they can speak up, there are, and I'm talking specifically speaking uh, about speaking up um, in regards to bringing people together with the, with the protesters, the actual protesters are doing you know, unity. You don't have to use your actual voice. There are my two children. I'm so proud of them. Both of them are taking part in various marches locally. You know, and as a mom, I'm like, okay, mask up, hand sanitize, we get home, shower, and all of that. But they're doing something. There might be other people who may have old school letter writing campaigns or Facebook campaigns. Still other people may be brave enough to begin to engage conversations with their local communities. Your local community could be the people in your house. It could be the people on your phone. You know, you we are doing this. I teach. So, I mean, there, that's a version of activism all the time. You know, I don't have a problem engaging in conversations like this. This is what I do. You know? So there are so many ways that people can engage. The people who are just realizing their sense of white fragility or white privilege and aren't hiding behind it. Maybe they say, I'm a little nervous about opening this door, but I'm willing to do it. If you have three or four more friends who are in that same area that you are in terms of being ready to do this, engage with, with your own community. So there are so many things that people can do that don't necessarily require them being extremely vulnerable by putting themselves out there, you know, to, to potentially receive flack from people they thought would support them. You don't have to do that, but you're doing something. But it does, it, it really does start um, with each person and also doing that internal examination, you know, as to where you are. Yeah. And I would like to add on my side, of dealing with this. Mm -hmm. I have been, I feel anytime anyone reaches out to me with a response to what I'm saying, what I'm putting out there, even if they're, especially if they're responding from a, a state of fragility, I have been reaching back out to a lot, a lot of phone conversations and Zoom meetings of, I feel genuine concern if there is someone, especially if there's someone that I've known for a number of years and they're responding to what I'm saying, feeling targeted. I want to talk with them and find out, I want to help them feel better and help them release whatever is this bullseye they've got 
inside of them. I've had a number of interesting conversations. And I can tell you from my side, growing up in Virginia, as again, a Unitarian Jew, when I grew up, I was not allowed to check white. You know, like when you have all the forms in school and you have to check your race. I was forbidden from checking white. I had to check other because Jews are not allowed to be. And then they, so, so I never really thought of myself as a white girl because I'm other. And last time we met, we talked about a birth of a nation. You know, that was shown in my schools as a history film. We would, I've saw that numerous times through my upbringing in schools. So if you have people who are given these, I mean, what we know are wrong and ignorant impressions during their impressionable years, it can be really confusing to then be told you're fragile, you have privilege, especially if they don't feel fragile and they don't feel privileged. They, it's a natural and understandable response to feel targeted and bullied by these words. So I tell people, honor your response, but explore them. As Uma said, explore them. See where they were born and what's going on because there were no words out of my mouth that really merited your response. So there is something in you that is highly responsive that deserves acknowledgement and exploration. And I have been with a few people where we have been on some very interesting journeys as to why words are triggering them. And I've also received some lessons back to me on ways where I can phrase things where I'm more educational and less explosive. So it's been a two-way journey. And, but it always comes down to, I have to be very non-reactive because if they're reactive, if I've triggered them and they're reacting, and then I'm reacting, we're not going to get anywhere. But when we come together and explore how we can have this conversation in a way that we feel resolved, we set like a flower bed where a garden for progress can grow. Can and I, it takes time. It takes effort. Yeah, but, I want to jump in on that too, Daryl. But you yeah. guys want to jump in on so that. So before I forget... Um, so, but it, I want to I want to tap into the word trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to challenge, not challenge you or push back on you, but for oh, feel welcome to. <laughs> no, 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 it's not because trust me, I would if I felt like I needed to. I, but no, it's but for the people who are watching, I want to also reposition it or explore it a little differently because it goes directly to what you were saying. There are many times that people, regardless of who you told, been told you are, regardless of where you live or what have you, there are people who will not take it upon themselves to look at things from multiple right. positions and push, positionality. But the other thing I wanted to say in terms of trigger, what I'm gonna say is, it's not you or it's not a person that triggers another person. Mm -hmm. They are triggered by, mm -hmm. let, let, hear me clearly, they, that other person is triggered by something that they heard mm -hmm. or something that was said, and that is an internal thing. Yes. And, 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 and they, they, they are triggered internally, and then they are, as Uma said, they're projecting back out. Mm -hmm. So I, I want people to look at that because here's the historic way and then narratives are so strong, right? So when, as I mentioned the last time and you pointed back to a few minutes ago, the history of this country has been narrated and propagated historically that this was the white man's land and everybody else was subservient, even white women. Well, that's bullshit. <laughs> yes. It is, it's absolute bullshit. But there are some people who are not going to be willing to understand the truth. Now, again, there's no objective truth. Every truth is subjective. But there are other facts that, at play that they may not entertain. And so if they're yes. not going to entertain that, and then they're met with something different, and they can't seem to understand what's going on, 
they are experiencing this sense of cognitive dissonance. And then their perception pops up. So, so my point in bringing this up is that there are multiple perspectives and in order for people to begin to do some of the things that we're hoping that they will to evolve, they one have to be willing. They have to be willing to hear experiences yes. that are not like theirs, that challenge fundamentally what they may have been raised to believe, right? All mm -hmm. of these racist constructs, even the construct of, I can't be racist because I'm a nice person. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, you can. Mm -hmm. and there's a continuum of how people experience that. You know, I talk about internalized racism. There's racism, there's intra, you know, racism within different cultures, colorism, all of these different things, but there's, a, a you know, a various perspectives and, and uh, you know that we need to be aware of but that word when you said trigger mm -hmm. what came up for me because don't want to make the mistake to put out there because people can manipulate everything that we're saying I want to I want to jump in on that because that was my thing. yeah but before Wait, I, forget, I, 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 I need to say something because we're running out of time and I really okay. need to say this okay go ahead mm -hmm. the way people react is their responsibility so I keep telling Bonita, it's very important. You don't take this on because this is, has nothing to do with you. Right. Even if, if you keep bending to suit other people because you don't want to make people angry or upset or you don't want to lose their friendship or whatever, you are further and further cutting your pieces of yourself off to put into a box. And then one day you're going to get really angry because you won't be able to say anything. It'll be so heavily censored. There is a large part of manipulation going on with people who practice and who have white fragility. Mm -hmm. They get upset, they get triggered and they do, you know, our, our new folklore thing. They do the Karen thing and they call the manager, which is they ream you out. And then when they ream you out, they get you to feel so bad about what you did in all innocence because you didn't, you didn't trigger anybody. You didn't target anybody. You were talking about your own experiences and they get you to start to backpedal on your story and make it more fitting for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's you essentially gotta, what I was going to say. So yeah, yeah. yeah, that was my, my original point. You, you just got to get okay with the idea that you're not the teacher for everyone. And you're probably oh, yeah. going to lose a very large part of your community. And even if you tried to change or stop posting or whatever, it's still not going to make them happy. Right. And not. to be clear, I just want to give for people watching the real definition for triggering is when you're young, you have an experience that if you have not fully resolved it, and those of us talk about life challenges and life path, this is it. If you have not fully resolved it, you will have an emotional connection to this. You may put up walls or you may like whatever saying, oh, I never want this to happen again. And then sometime later in life, someone says or does something that triggers the emotional memory can't even be the psychological memory of that moment. And you respond to the person in the many years later, but what you're really responding to is what happened way back when. So this is a trigger or it can be an auto response mm -hmm. or whenever you're fighting with someone you care about and you're like, you always, you never, you're doing it again. And you're not in the moment with the person. And part of getting evolving white fragility is really about the people who feel fragile being willing to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. You can't force anyone to get over white fragility. You can't force anyone to get over anything. Um, I try as a teacher to help people with it. But yes, uh, certainly this last week, there have been a number of people who are angry at me and have disassociated with me. And there are other people who have now said, wow, you're interesting, I wanna be your friends. That I'm not worried about. And I don't feel the need to be everyone's friend, but certainly Uma, I do have a lot to think about. I do have a lot to think about. And I told you today that I, as you, by speaking out, I now have people threatening my family, threatening, my home, 
threatening my business, threatening my reputation. I've been receiving a lot of threats. And I'm also told it's not my right to react to these threats because I'm white. So I get white disprivilege. Wow. If I were dark wow. skin like you, then I'd get to speak out. So what I'm telling me, the common thread between all of them is shut up and just teach your night spiritual stuff, you crazy old B word. You know, that's basically what they're telling me. Shut up. No one wants to hear what you have to say. You know, and I'm like, well, that doesn't sit well with me either. Right. But I don't need to react to what they're saying because when I feel triggered by what they're saying, I'm like, I need to stop and think about this. And we spoke about this earlier. I said, I have a lot to think about because I need to go forward with action, not reaction. And in order to do that, I need to make sure I'm clean in here and I feel good about my actions going forward. Believe me, I would love for us to meet this way once a week, like forever, because I feel like we have a lot to say. No one's going to shut that up. However, I will also continue teaching meditation and energy work and helping people connect with their past lives. I don't need to be either or. Mm -hmm. And I do not need to make any decisions based on my skin color. And I hate to say it because I'm white. I get to do that. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, you do. Yes. And so here's the I, thing. I, Uma I, and, I, and for everybody else who's not white, we all get to do the same thing. It's a yeah. thing in our resolve. You know, I'm sure I push a lot of people's buttons. I don't care. I push my family's buttons. I push my students' buttons. I push buttons of people who I probably don't know. I don't care. It's also part of my purpose and my walk on life because, you know, we have to be open to deal with the things that we're not comfortable with, especially if we're trying to move towards human equity, which again, I keep bringing back to that is what's happening during our time now across yeah. the world, which is so heartening. It is wonderful to see so many people standing together and standing up for, you know, just really the equity of all people's lives. The one thing I do want to throw in here really quickly is because I started out with saying how this was indigenous land and we always forget that there um, were, you know, protests all over the world, but in Australia, um, there was a young man. Oh, yeah. His name, yeah, who was our Aboriginal, which in our world is the equivalent of black and brown skin and indigenous skin. Mm -hmm. He was also, I don't know if it was several months ago or last year, he was also killed by the police there and said the words, I can't breathe. It was videotaped. And so I like to say same shit, different place. They said it a lot better, um, but it's really the same thing. It is a lot of crimes against black and brown and indigenous people and skin by the powers of however whiteness is, is sh shows up and has been constructed in those particular communities. So this isn't just um, a, a United States issue. Right. A lot of countries like to hold us up to a country, in, which is true, that has not dealt with the racism in it. But other countries, as I mentioned uh, last week, also have unresolved issues. And so that is one clear example. And, and sadly, the plight of police brutality against Black and Brown and Indigenous bodies is something that happens across the world, but it is bringing lots of people together. And so when the, when black and brown bodies cease to be objectified and brutalized just for being, it's going to make the world a better place for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, Uma, I know you got something you've been patiently waiting to share. Um, about how we can turn this around? Is that mm -hmm. what you, yeah, about yeah. how we can turn this around. My thing is, um, for those that have white fragility, the one thing that you can do to empower yourself and empower the community is to take personal responsibility. Sometimes you just have to look at the mirror and say, this is what I am. It is what it is. Now I can't fix the past, but I can fix the future. Mm -hmm. And if me taking ownership of the fact that I have white privilege, I have some white fragility. Now, let me now see how I can heal this within myself and then how can I go forward and actually help a community, okay? Mm -hmm. 
my path is a path of service. I'm here to serve and that's what I'm doing. I know it's not for many, but I think we can all have some healing from self-service. So my cry out to the white community is please take personal responsibility. You all know a family member or a friend who has made a racist comment in your lifetime. Okay, several. So just own that and say, I may not know how traumatic or hurtful or painful this has been for people of color, but I'm willing to open my eyes. I'm willing to be a better neighbor. I'm willing to help in some kind of way. And that's what I'm asking for. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And also like two resources, as we said, um, the video that I posted earlier with Robin D'Angelo. Thank you, thank you. And also uh, Brene Brown's Daring Greatly, which is about the courage of being sensitive within yourself, the courage of being insecure, the courage of being, looking in yourself and being your honest person. That is a brilliant book. And anyone who is feeling fragile, no matter what skin color you are, I, I totally recommend that book. I'll put the link to it here but especially white fragile, yeah. read Brene Brown. Can I add just a couple more resources? Of course, anything I'm a proponent and love Tim Wise, for those people who have a little thicker skin and really are working deep in their Tim Wise. Um, but for our Latino brothers and sisters, I want to suggest Danielle Pilar's book. I believe it's called The Power of Race in Cuba. And it's about black consciousness during the revolution. Um, but I don't want you to think it's only about um, a Black-white dynamic uh, in Cuba. It is absolutely relevant to our conversation, and it goes to the heart of those people who are from countries where colorism is actually what is um, uh, touted versus blatant racism, where, where nationality is what's talked about, but there's colorism within there. So that's a good book that I think... Um, would address some of those issues and highlight some of what we're talking about. Oh, that's great. And could you um, maybe after our live stream post that information in the comments? Sure. Oh, that would be great. Okay. Oh, well, you guys, we have to go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for this, Benita. This was awesome. Yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the comments. You know what, keep the comments going because I know that if you're thinking it and you share it, other people who are watching this will want to read it. And, you know, we, 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 this should be a conversation. This should be for all of us to come together and rise up. Thank you, Benita, for hosting. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And everyone have a wonderful day. We love you. Bye. Bye.